So far we've discussed L2 regularized logistic regression and we briefly mentioned what happens when you have L1 regularized logistic regression. Let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. Unlike in the regression course, we're not going to derive the learning algorithm for L1 regularized logistic regression. It's going to be the similar thing to what you did with LASSO. We're just going to show kind of the impact it has on our data, on our um, learned models. So recall the notion of sparsity. So a model is sparse when many of those WJs are equal to zero. And that can help us with both efficiency and interpretability of the models, as we saw in regression. So for example, let's say that we have a lot of data and a lot of features. So the number of Ws that you have can say be 100 billion, 100 billion possible values. This can happen in uh, practice in all sorts of settings. For example, many of the spam filters out there have hundreds of billions of parameters in there or coefficients that they learn from data. So this has a couple problems. It can be expensive to make a prediction. You have to go through 100 billion values. However, if I have a sparse solution where many of these Ws are actually equal to zero, then when I'm trying to make a prediction, so I'm trying to compute the sign of Wj times the feature Hj of Xi, I only have to look at no zero coefficients Wj. Everything else can be ignored. So if I have 100 billion coefficients, but only say 100,000 of those are non-zero, then it's gonna be much faster to make a prediction. This makes a huge difference in practice. The other impact the sparsity has, having many zero coefficients being zero, is that it can help you interpret the non-zero coefficients. So you can look at the small number of non-zero coefficients and try to make an interpretation. Oh, this is why a prediction gets made. And such interpretations can be useful in practice in many ways. So how would you learn logistic regression classifier with uh, uh, sparsity in it, sparsity inducing penalty? So what we do is we take the same log likelihood function LW, but we add uh, extra L1 penalty, which is the sum of the absolute value of W0, the absolute value of W1, all the way to the absolute value of WD. So by just changing the square, sum of squares to be sum of absolute values, we go into what's called L1 regularized logistic regression, which gives you sparse solutions. So that small change leads to sparse solutions. So just like we did with uh, L2 regularization, here, we're also going to have a parameter, lambda, which controls how much regularization we introduce, so how much penalty we introduce. And the objective becomes the log likelihood of the data minus lambda times the sum of these absolute values, the L1 penalty. When lambda equals to zero, we have no regularization, which leads us to the standard MLE solution, solution, just like we had in the case of uh, L2 regularization. Now, when lambda is equal to infinity, we have only penalty, so all weight is on regularization. And that's going to lead to W hat being everything zero, all zero coefficients. Now, the case that we really care about it was when lambda somewhere between zero and infinity, which leads to what are called sparse solutions, solutions where some WJs are not going to be equal to zero, but hopefully many other WJs, and this is our estimate, so WJ hats are going to be exactly zero. So that's what we're going to try to aim for. So let's revisit those coefficient paths. And here I'm showing the coefficient paths of L2 penalty. You see that when the lambda parameter is low, you have large coefficients learned. And when the lambda parameters gets larger, you get smaller coefficients. So they go from large to small, but they're never exactly zero. So the coefficients never become exactly zero. If you look, however, at the coefficient paths 
when the regularization is L1, we get something much more interesting. So, for example, in the beginning, uh, the coefficient of the smiley face, oops, that should be frowny, that should be smiley face, has a large positive value, but eventually becomes exactly zero from here on. Um, and similarly, the coefficient for the frowning case, for the frowning face, is a large negative value, but eventually over here, the frowning face uh, has a coefficient that becomes zero. And so it goes from large all the way to exactly zero. And you see that for many of the other words. So for example, in the beginning, the coefficient of the word hate is pretty high, and that's a pretty important word. But around here, um, hate becomes irrelevant. And so it's just a quick reminder. These are uh, product reviews and try to figure out whether it's a positive or negative review for the product. And what we can look at what coefficient stays non-zero for the longest time. And this is exactly this line over here, where it never kind of hits zero, never stays exactly zero. Um, and this is the coefficient of the word disappointed. So you might be disappointed to learn that frowny face is not the one that <laughs> becomes zero. But in the beginning, disappointed is not as, uh, um, uh, the coefficient is not as large, so it's not as significant as the frowny face, but it's the one that, take, that stays uh, negative for the longest. And so frowny face um, uh, is not, it might be disappointed, so frowny face is not as important as disappointed. And disappointed, probably because it's prevalent in more reviews, and when you say disappointed, you're really like in a negative review, that coefficient goes on for a long time. So you see these transitions. So uh, the coefficient of those small numbers like reviews uh, goes to zero early on. Um, smiley face lasts for a while and then becomes zero. Uh, frowny face lasts for longer and then becomes exactly zero. But for sufficiently large lambdas, all of those are zero except for the coefficient of disappointment.